which one, which one it... <laughs> My hair! Don't look at me! So, Pokemon Sun and Moon came out last month, and so far there have been a lot of positives and negatives about the two games. So, enter Gaming Bolt, which is a video game news, reviews, and all that jazz review site, and has a YouTube channel too. And recently, they released a video called 15 Things That Hardcore Players Hate About Pokemon Sun and Moon. I'm already dubious about the video since the title and the thumbnail, aside from being very lazy for a group this size. I mean, seriously, it's just a black background with two characters. I mean, what the hell here? Anyway, the thumbnail and the video title don't match up. There's that little tap done hardcore on the title, which is giving me a bit of a Dobbs flashback. So a bonehead, a pair of po- Oh, Arceus, no, not that one. We don't talk about that one. Now, before we actually begin, I do have to say that, yes, I am a fan of the games, and I'm able to look at the games with my fanboy glasses off and notice flaws, unlike certain others. So there are two ways I can go with this video. I could create a rational and calm counter arguments with some basic jokes, yet in a respectable manner, or... <laughs> I think you and I both know what I'm gonna do. Gaming Bolt presents 15 things players hate about Pokemon Sun and Moon. Barely 10 seconds in, and I already know I made this point before, but I want to say that this reinforces that they only add the hardcore part to cover their asses on this. Also, to expand upon this point, this raises so many questions on who is making the complaints that we'll see later in this video. It just raises too many questions. For example, what determines a hardcore player? Well, the video never talks about that, so I have to come to the conclusion that yes, it was just tacked on as a means of deflecting criticism. A really slow start. Pokemon Sun and Moon are more story focused than any of the previous games in the series. The payoff is in a hugely changed structure this time around, and in a largely great story, told really well. However, such a story-centric focus comes with its own caveats. For instance, take the starting of the game. It's extremely long, and the first few hours of the game are spent in a setup of the world, the characters, and the narrative, not to mention bogged down with the endless tutorials that Pokemon is famous for. Things get better after a couple hours into the game, but those first few hours can be a pain in the neck, especially for those of you who just want to set out on your own adventure to be the very best, like no one ever was. This complaint is puzzling. Yes, I will agree to the opening that Sun and Moon are slow, but saying that it's a few hours after you get to go on your journey, that's really debatable and depending on the player. You get your start of roughly about 20 minutes into the game and experience the combat at the same time with your rival. While there are some non skippable catchable tutorials, you're still able to go around and catch Pokemon and even get a few battles in, all the way before the 30 minute mark. It's not like you're completely bogged down with tutorials. Heck, there are enough playthroughs on YouTube itself that can attest to that. Battles are now slower. It's not just the starting of the game that's slower, battles in the game are slower too. After Black and White and X and Y made huge strides towards making Pokemon battles snappy, battles here are beset by slower text speeds and a few seconds of waiting before a turn begins, and inexplicable regression such as the HP bar draining out very slowly instead of instantaneously like it did the last few games. It doesn't matter enough in any one individual battle, but through the course of the entire game, it can get annoying. If a player just wants to be hardcore and train furiously, then they just turn off the battle animations and speed up the text speed. The game has options for that. On another note, I love how you use an example to prove that the health bar goes down between two extremely low-leveled Pokemon, especially to show the case that after using Growl, the physical attack that's used here doesn't do a lot of damage, which is what Growl does. Full of super training. Super Training was the excellent series of minigames that made EVs transparent and let players buff their Pokemon up. <laughs> oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> EVs still remain transparent in Sun and Moon, but Super Training is now gone. In its place are a series of facilities aimed at EV training your Pokemon scattered throughout the game, a lot of which are gated either up front or require in-game payment per use. They're arguably more effective in that they don't require the player to play mini games and yield the benefit to the player immediately. But the strength of super training was that it was centralized and that it was persistent. And that's gone now. Scattered? I I'm sorry, but what? What facilities are you referring to? While super training is gone, the players get access to something that is much more efficient to EV training. The Poke Palaco. More specifically, I'll Ellup. And I just got the pun. Thank you, Game Freak. 
Here, once you develop it enough, you can EV train up to 18 Pokemon while you play the rest of the game. Not only is that a time saver, allowing the player to train more Pokemon at once, but it does it automatically so the players can do other things too. It's more efficient, and since the player doesn't have to have to play the mini games, it's a great time saver. Also, it doesn't cost anything other than the Poke Beans, and that's only if you want to speed up the praying process. Even then, in Poke Palago, you get free Poke Beans every few hours. By the by, hardcore players, whatever that means to this video, would jump at this because they can effectively train more than just one Pokemon at a time, and it's still centralized since all you gotta do is go to the touch screen below and enter Poke Palago. The removal of 3D. Uh, excuse me? Hey there, buddy, you got some 3D graphics there right now. And yes, I'm aware that they'll get to what they actually mean immediately, I just wanted to be a smartass. Not a whole lot of people like stereoscopic 3D, but there are some that do. And for those that don't, the beauty of the 3DS is that it allows them the option to simply turn the 3D off and keep playing the game in 2D. Pokemon Sun and Moon, however, do not give the players that option. Instead, players are left playing the entire game in 2D because the 3D option has been nerfed entirely. Now, the implementation of 3D in the previous Pokemon games was never too great to begin with, but we must admit to being disappointed that instead of trying to improve it, they just decided to remove it altogether. I call this a nitpick, but there is actually stereoscopic 3D in the game. Just not in the battling, mind you. But remember, they said entire game, which is not true. You can get stereoscopic 3D during the photography side quests. Like I said, nitpick possible but it still goes against the idea of what they just said. Dream, mm -hmm. SOS Battles SOS battles are actually a great new mechanic that keeps battles with wild Pokemon variable and make EV training, hunting for shiny Pokemon, hunting for rare Pokemon, hunting for Pokemon with hidden abilities, hunting for Pokemon with better natures, or hunting for Pokemon with better IVs extremely easy. So why hate them? simply because there are so many of them. Every second wild Pokemon battle in the game can turn into a protracted affair, as Pokemon try to call other wild Pokemon to their aid. There's an easy way to fix this, just inflict any status condition on the wild Pokemon and it won't call for help. But for the more casual players, having an endless wave of wild Pokemon attacking them can get extremely annoying after a while. And congratulations, you just shot your video's title in the foot. Remember, everybody, HARDCORE! Complete opposite of what they just said. Even then, SOS battling aren't as bad as they are making it out to be for casual players. While there are factors you can use to initiate the SOS battles, like having Intimidate or Adrenaline Orb, they're mostly random and not a guarantee. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't issues with the system, but at the same time you're able to run from the battles if they get out of control, and even if you don't, there are ways to stop the SOS battles from going on, such as inflicting status conditions. And like you yourself said, there are a lot more positives than negatives here, especially for the hardcore fans like your video says. Heck, you can use SOS battles early in the game to get a Salamence on your team. <laughs> New Difficult Evolution Mechanics I got a shotgun. <laughs> Pokemon Sun and Moon introduced some incredibly great new Pokemon, but they're also making evolving them a total pain in the neck. Take Salandit, for example. It's an incredible fire poison type Pokemon that's a great addition to any team, but it's crippled by the fact that only female Salandit evolve into Salazzle. Why is this an issue? It's an issue because only 12.5% or 1 in 8 Salandit found in the wild are female. This isn't new, in fact this has actually been done before with Combi and Vespaquin. Pretty much exactly since the same rate of encounters for females. I'd argue that a female Saladin is easier to find since in the original games of Combi's introduction, you actually had to use an item to find it. Also, allow me to go off tangent here, you can actually find a way to get a female Saladin really easily in the game. All you need is a male Pokemon with cute charm as an ability, and luckily before you reach the location that you can catch a Saladin, the game gives you a chance to get an Igglybuff or an Eevee, the latter of which can evolve into Sylveon and get Q-Charm to raise the chances of coming across the female Pokemon by up to 67% and that ignores the gender ratio. Now while that is a tangent, it's something I wanted to point out, mainly because this is something that a hardcore player would know, since it's a little trick that after Gen 3 that players have used. Oh, Sylveon, you strike my heart, baby. Then there's the Crab Crabrawler, an excellent fighting type Pokemon that can only be evolved in one very specific location that isn't found until the very end of the game. Why must you make evolving our Pokemon so difficult, Game Freak? Come on. Once again, not really new, and it's kind of been going on for years. The Eevee lines have Glaceon and Leafeon, who need a specific location to evolve. Heck, there's also Magneton and Nosepass, who both need specific locations in previous games to evolve. 
You only listed two methods of evolution that were introduced three generations ago. This isn't really anything new. Wild Pokemon that are just impossible to get. But just finding wild Pokemon to begin with can be difficult. A lot of new wild Pokemon are incredibly rare in the wild, such as Mimikyu and jengmo o which have an encounter rate of 5% or 1 in 20. And again, nothing really new here. Yes, there are Pokemon with lower encounter rates, just like in previous games, like V-Bass and Aurat, 5%, or some fish Pokemon like Wishcash that only have 5%. Also, how dare the more elusive and stronger Pokemon be harder to find? It's not like that's the point of finding rare Pokemon. That's bad enough, but then there's the fact that a whole lot of Pokemon can only be found in extremely obtuse ways. To get a wild Pikachu, for instance, or a Marini, you must battle other wild Pokemon and wait for them to call for help, where there is a small chance that these ones will appear. I would like to point out that you can catch wild Pichu and evolve into a Pikachu, so that's a bit of an inflation of the issue. As for Marini, while I will agree that you do have to go out of your way to find a course let it get it, that's kind of the point with SOS battling. They're trying to get you to use the new mechanic and give you a boost there. But Gumi probably takes the cake here. To find a Gumi in the wild, you must initiate a wild Pokemon battle when it's raining, which can be totally random by the way, and wait for that Pokemon to call for help and hope Gumi shows up. Game Freak, why? And this is a complete lie. There are certain areas where rain is always happening such as the route outside Po Town, Route 17, or Executor Island, the latter having Gumi's evolution, Siglu, there. In addition, weather moves and abilities can also be used to initiate specific SOS battles. It's not really random. <laughs> <laughs> that was rather random. <sighs> Items that are hard to get. Pokemon Sun and Moon makes great strides to make life easier for the players, but for hardcore players, they make several decisions that are truly perplexing. One of these is their decision to make items such as Destiny Knot, vital for breeding the perfect Pokemon, harder to get. You can still eventually get them, they're not gone, and the game making things transparent means that you're not going to be stumbling around in the dark when you do, but getting them in the first place can be really annoying. I'd say this is more arguable since a lot of the key items in Sun and Moon are acquirable by exchanging BP for them. This Neon is a prime example since while it is a pickup item, you can also get it from the Royal Avenue for 48 BP. Buying the item seems a lot less of a hassle than going out of your way to finding it on a random route. You can also get much anything else from Pokepalago in the Festival Plaza. Fishing Mechanics Changes Fishing in older Pokemon games was as easy as walking up to a body of water, pulling out your fishing rod, and fishing. That's changed this time around, as now you can only fish at specific designated fishing spots. Can I just take a minute to point out there's a lot of footage here that is, isn't really used to correlate what they're saying in these segments. I get that they had like a small scene of the player character about to fish at this segment, but really you couldn't be bothered to put some relevant footage here. And this is where I could throw out the entire video. Customization Restrictions Sun and Moon feature expanded customization options for your trainer, especially compared to any previous Pokemon games in the series. But then they make the boneheaded decision of locking out a lot of these options behind specific versions. Put simply, if you're playing Pokemon Sun and you want a blue shirt, or you're playing Pokemon Moon and want a red top, you're out of luck. Red and warmer colors and blue and cooler colors are exclusive to Pokemon Sun and Moon respectively. Hence why you can get dyes from the Festival Plaza. There are shops in the Festival Plaza that will allow you to bypass that, so it is possible to get the non-accessible colors in the games through that. Heck, you can even show that's the case in the footage since I can see the Festival Coins tag. While I will admit you can't get the colored clothing in the shops, it's not impossible to get a blue shirt in a Pokemon Sun and a red shirt in Moon. Granted, it can be done a lot better, but I digress. Also, this comes off as a really, really weird complaint, especially since hardcore players wouldn't really care for an aesthetic like this. Pokefinder remains underutilized. The Pokefinder is a photography-based minigame in Pokemon Sun and Moon that could have really been something. It could have been the return to Pokemon Snap, the beloved cult classic photography-based Pokemon game, if nothing else. So, it's really disappointing that it remains underutilized in Sun and Moon. Photography spots are limited, options are limited, the Pokemon you are photographing only strike a few poses before they start repeating themselves, and there's no way to share the photos you've taken with other players in the game. Uh, you do know that you can save your photos you choose from each session on your SD card and then share them via other formats than social media, right? I get it's something you have to do outside the game, but it's not like you're lifting a 50 pound dumbbell. You can share the photos. <laughs> So would a hardcore player really care about something like this? No side quest trackers. 
Pokemon Sun and Moon feature an expanded side quest system, where you can go and catch specific Pokemon for NPCs, find their Pokemon that have scattered about in the overworld, and more. But there's no way to track these side quests. So, if you accept a quest and then stop playing and then come back to the game a couple days later, well, the game will never tell you that you accepted the side quest to begin with. Do you really need to track them? It's not like we're talking about huge fetch quests here. Most of them involve just showing up with a certain Pokemon in your party, and that's the only one that's really big is the one you refer to. It actually does have a tracking feature to it! This is most egregious with the Zygarde side quest, because the game never tells you how many Zygarde cells you have collected and which ones, meaning trying to track all of them down can be truly taxing. Except if you look at the Zygarde cube in your inventory, then the game tells you exactly how many cells you have. And this is so easy to check if you look at your key items. In addition, while there are times where you won't remember the exact timing and location of the Zygarde cells, thanks to the handy dandy little thing called the internet, you can track them easily. Something that hardcore players would know about. And with that, I end this video with my final thoughts. Well, while there are some criticisms I can agree with, such as the lagging that I skipped since I experienced that in my own playthroughs of the game, even though that was only during the Battle Royal portions, this list felt extremely nitpicky. Especially since a lot of the complaints seemed to fall into the more towards the casual side of players and had some outright wrong information, such as the new evolution mechanics. What I see here is just a way easy way to get clickbaiting YouTube money, and adding that hardcore to the title just made the video all the more confusing and worse. This comes off as whining that the games got slightly more challenging, and there are legit criticisms, but that's for another time and video. Till then, I'm Skullcommon, and have a nice day, my friends. Hey guys, if you liked the video, please consider leaving a like. The channel has been really blowing up recently and we're almost close to 8,000 subscribers. I hope you guys can help me out with that, and I appreciate all of you for taking your time to watch this video. You guys are awesome, and I hope you have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Eat.